When this car was made 70 years ago, hot rodding was burgeoning. People were taking parts from bigger cars, from airplanes, casting new parts, and hoping it all didn't just spontaneously catch on fire for no reason. Today, electric hot rodding is not too different. Is that motor any good? Those batteries? Is that charger safe? There is one company that makes great parts for your electric hot rod. Unfortunately, they also don't like to make it easy to use their systems, or buy their parts, or work on their cars. It seems like they don't want us to use their systems in our non-Tesla cars, but some of us, we're gonna do it anyway. Cause f them. This might go without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There are good reasons that Tesla doesn't want you inside their battery pack. It's not because they're trying to keep secrets. They know that every auto company out there is gonna buy one of their cars and disassemble it to the smallest part using x-ray machines and chainsaws if necessary. They make it hard to open because they don't want people to get electrocuted and die. And you can die. OSHA considers voltages above 50 to be hazardous. This battery runs at a nominal 350 volts or seven times that. Say you step on this post right here, and then with your other foot, you step on this post here. 350 volts travels through your body, and your d explodes. Notice I bleeped so we're still gender neutral here. Hashtag inclusion, hashtag exploding I have taken high voltage safety training at two different EV companies, and I have the right safety equipment, mostly, so I feel pretty comfortable digging around in here. But if you plan on doing the same, make sure you do your safety research, and make sure you know what you're doing. You're going to sound really stupid explaining to the paramedics that you blew off your left hand because you were loosely following a YouTube video by a guy who calls himself Superfast Matt. Tesla makes great car batteries, the best by most metrics. There are obvious benefits of using a Tesla battery on an EV conversion, like energy density, but some other benefits too, now that there are companies selling controllers that allow you to actually use the components inside. If you do an EV conversion, you need some things in addition to your battery. You need a charger, a battery management system, a DC-DC converter for the low voltage stuff. The Tesla battery has all that stuff up in this part here. This saves a lot of money not having to buy and wire all that stuff together. It's also nice not to have to search through questionable EV equipment. A lot of those parts are either really expensive or poorly made stuff that will catch on fire, or both. To control all that stuff, you need to get a controller. There are a few companies that will sell you one for the Model S or X powertrain, but for the Model 3, you'll probably need to go to Nginext. I like these guys so far. They're very helpful. Their controller seems to do its job pretty well. I'll talk a little bit more about this controller in another video, but I like it so far. Before you can control a Tesla motor and battery, you need to get a Tesla motor and battery. I considered looking for a salvage wrecked Model 3 to get my parts out of, but I decided to call around to some salvage yards to see what a battery and motor would cost me. I needed more than just the rear motor and battery. I wanted the whole drive unit inside the complete rear subframe with brakes and suspension. I also needed the charge port, the controller for the charge port, the high voltage cables connecting the battery and the drive unit, and the rear subframe harness. I also needed a complete sealed battery with all the goodies inside. I got a note back from a salvage yard near Sacramento called Cali Motive. They had the best price and were in reasonable driving distance. Their yard is on a street just south of Sacramento that is lined entirely with auto salvage yards, just miles of racks of salvage cars, any modern make and model. The guys at Cali Motive were awesome. They made sure I had all the parts I needed, all the connectors and harnesses and everything. Highly recommended if you're looking to do this sort of thing. I rented a U-Haul trailer, which worked fine, except for that the trailer I got has a narrower opening in the rear than the width of the battery, so we had to forklift it in. Getting it out was a little more difficult since I don't have a forklift at home. I stopped by Harbor Freight and picked up one of their engine hoists. At home, I wrapped some straps around the battery, hoisted it up, and then drove the trailer out from under the pack. Then I could lower it a little bit and drag it into the garage, where it sat for a few weeks. As you can see, my battery quickly became a storage shelf. It takes up a lot of space. I've been watching some other YouTube builds, and I gotta say I'm really below average with my two-car garage. I'm gonna need some more subscribers so I can get some more sponsors, so I can get some money, so I can have a place for my seats. This video, sponsored by Shelves. Get a shelf. Put stuff on it. Shelves. There's a lot of good info out there on Tesla's long-range battery, but not a whole lot on the smaller pack. It stores less energy and can't output enough power to drive the dual-motor performance powertrain, but it has some advantages. It's lighter, which is great for general comfort and efficiency, and it's cheaper by a fair amount. I'm only running one motor in the Jag, and I don't really need to be able to drive 300 miles between charges, so this is pretty perfect for me. Previously, I mentioned that I thought there might be smaller modules in the standard range battery, which would make it easier for me to package. 
I found some pictures online of smaller modules in a pack, but I wasn't sure if these were speculative Photoshop or maybe the China made battery. Anyway, I tore open my pack to check and was disappointed to see full size modules. It appears that maybe the middle rows don't have cells in them. I don't know. It doesn't really matter at this point since I'm not going to open the individual modules. You can't really do that anyway, since they're all glued together with this goo. Goo. Getting into the battery requires some special tools. This is an early theme of the Jaguar Tesla project as the Jaguar had those Whitworth fasteners and several of you pointed out those require Whitworth tools. Well, on those, I just hammered whatever Imperial or metric socket was the closest. I have decided that I'm gonna replace every single fastener on this car. The battery, however, I can't just hammer on the nearest socket size because most of them are not hex. There are a lot of unconventional fasteners here. One of them is a super secret five lobe external Torx Plus. It's so secret that the only way to get it is to go on Google and type super secret Tesla five lobe socket and then buy it from one of the dozen companies that sell it. You can also just use pliers, but there's a lot of thread locker, so I would definitely use the super secret socket. You also need a regular six lobe external Torx plus size EP8 for the perimeter bolts, and you'll need an external Torx 10 for some random bolts. This one is not Torx plus, it's just regular external Torx. It's weird to mix those two, but whatever. There are also bolts in the middle. Some are 24 millimeter, some need a 10 millimeter Allen wrench, and the rest need a 12 millimeter Allen wrench. You also need a hammer and a putty knife to break the seal around the edge. This doesn't seem like a super safe way to do this, what with the high voltage battery inside, but I couldn't think of a better way to get this open. I didn't have a 12 millimeter Allen wrench. I also didn't have the external Torx or the external Torx Plus sockets, nor the super secret Tesla socket. I had to buy five tools just to get into this battery, which is weird because I have a lot of tools. I'm starting to think Tesla doesn't want me inside this battery. The Jaguar awesomely has this service manual that tells you how to take apart and work on the whole car. Tesla is less open with this information, but they do have a service manual that shows you how to access and remove most components, though it doesn't specifically tell you how to remove the top cover and penthouse from the battery. The service manual seems to be available from service.teslamotors.com. A couple of weird things about this site. Tesla has been using tesla.com for a while, having switched from teslamotors.com a few years ago, but this address only works if you type out teslamotors.com. Also, they want money, lots of money, $3,000 a year or a hundred bucks a day. There are some interesting conversations on the forums about how you can get free access if you live in some states or if you register through certain countries' websites. Anyway, I found a manual the legal way as far as you know, and it was somewhat helpful in getting this all apart. This part up here is called the penthouse, presumably because it's on top of the battery and not because it's filled with pictures of naked ladies. The penthouse is an interesting mix of serviceability. Like here, this part, it's on a hinge. You can just swing it out of the way to get to this part below it. Super easy serviceability. This top part is bolted to the cover we just took off, so it might be hinged up to isolate these two parts for some other reason. Anyway, some of these other parts are really hard to get to. Let's say you break your coolant connector on the outside or the high voltage connector. You then have to disassemble every part of the penthouse to get those parts replaced. How likely is it that you break one of these connectors? Stay tuned. These batteries all contain a fuse that can disconnect the battery circuit by blowing itself up. It's called the pyro fuse. If you wreck your Tesla and the airbags go off, so does the pyro fuse. I bought this battery from a wrecked car, so I knew the pyro fuse was probably popped. The guys at Cali Motive gave me a good one to replace the old one with. I checked the resistance across the old fuse to make sure it was, in fact, exploded. Then I checked the replacement one just to be sure. The first thing you do when taking apart these batteries is to remove the pyro fuse. It breaks the circuit, so if you accidentally touch this thing over here and then that thing over there, your d won't explode. It's not totally safe this way because these two modules are still connected and these two are still connected, so don't be shoving your fingers in any random places. After I took out the blown fuse, I had to take it apart to see what was going on. It's pretty neat. The fuse itself is a straight metal bar with two weak points on either side. This used to be straight. At the bottom, there is the explodey part. This one has exploded. When it exploded, it broke one of the weak connections on the metal bar, bending it out of the way. This disconnected the two sides. There are some other interesting bits in here. There are these radiator fin looking things. These are perpendicular to the explosion direction and I think they're there to sort of make the explosion change directions to reduce its energy. Then the explodey gas has to turn again to go around to the other side and then through this filter material before it gets out of the fuse. This keeps all the explodey bits from getting all over your battery. 
According to the manual, this part here, the power conversion system, is supposed to be held in with either 6 bolts or 4 bolts depending on when it came off the production line. Mine had 5 bolts, which is weird, but better than 3. I wasn't sure how much I had to disassemble the penthouse to get it off of the modules, but I thought I might have been far enough here. I scraped off the sealant and gave it a bit of a tug. This removal was not nearly as elegant as I was hoping. I had disconnected all the modules from each other, so I wasn't too worried about sparky time, but still. I did break one of the connectors. It's not a super important one, just the connector for the high voltage cable from the battery to the motor. Unfortunately, Tesla doesn't sell these parts at the Tesla store. Fortunately, there's eBay. I got the replacement part from the same people I got the motor and battery from. I actually just bought the larger assembly because I might use the middle part to relocate the pyro fuse when I repackage the battery. As I was digging around on eBay, I found this part that seems to be the Tesla tool used to remove the connector from the battery, but I'll just hope I don't need to disassemble it again. In any case, to answer my previous question, you have to remove basically everything inside the penthouse before you can pull it off the battery. Even now that I have it off, I have to disassemble the rest of it to get to the part to replace that I broke. So there you go. No shortcuts to the penthouse. There are a few challenging things in getting this off, like this weird connector to what I'm guessing is the battery management system boards on the modules. This is a little hard to carefully unplug, but this one over here is pretty inaccessible. In any case, these connectors are interesting. Below the penthouse, there are similarly interesting connectors going between the boards. I'm assuming the springy design is because of thermal expansion and contraction of the modules, but it seems like a lot just for that. Cunningham's Law states that the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, but to post the wrong answer. So I'll just say that these plastic springy cable mounts are there to isolate the connections from, we'll say, cosmic radiation, and then I'll just wait for the correct answer in the comments. As a side note, I did try to fix this connector after I broke it. I had it working pretty well with some super glue and crossed fingers. The connector has these two small pins in the middle. This is the part for the high voltage interlock loop, the HVIL. This is a loop that won't allow the contactors to close unless you actually have cables plugged in. This is so you can't turn on the battery and shove your fingers in the holes and die. I could just jumper these wires inside the battery and forget about these broken pins, but that seems unsafe. Sometimes I like to stick my fingers in mysterious holes, but I know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna get this to work just long enough for me to forget that I half-ass fixed it. Then it's gonna break again, and I'm not gonna remember to look at that connector and I'll waste a week replacing random ass parts. Also, it's carrying 400 volts and many amps, so maybe I'll err on the safe side. <laughs> Bit of a bummer that I had to remove everything because I want to keep all of the penthouse stuff in the penthouse and just move that to a different part of the car. It would have been a lot easier if this was just a removable subassembly. I should send them a letter. Dear penthouse. I mean, dear Tesla. I should be able to remotely mount the penthouse with only four wires connecting the main battery to the penthouse, the main positive and negative high voltage cables, and the two side battery management system cables. I should be able to mount the pyrofuse and shunt directly onto the two center modules inside the new battery case. This part I bought to replace my broken connector also has the mounts for that assembly, so I can cut that part out and mount it directly to the battery if it's feasible. I might also try to move the contactors inside the battery case. This would be a safer design. If I have exposed high voltage cables that are always high voltage, that could be dangerous. But if I put the contactors inside the battery case, that means I can keep all the sparky spiciness inside the main battery case when the contactors are open. In any case, the penthouse is not going to be high atop the battery anymore. It'll be in a different place. So I shall rename it. I will call it the outhouse. For the sake of further safety, it would be nice if I could figure out a way to wire up an accelerometer that would blow the pyrofuse whenever it detected a substantial impact. Say, a certain acceleration for a specified period of time. Tesla does this on their cars, but it's tied to the airbags going off. I don't have airbags, but I could probably do something similar. I can for sure have an emergency button that blows the pyrofuse, maybe with a pin in it like a fire extinguisher or a grenade. I'll call it the $200 button since that's about what it'll cost me every time I press it. The battery part of the battery is interesting. These boards are kind of just sitting here with tiny, delicate connections. The modules are held in with bolts on the outside, but each side is missing two, which I'm guessing is part of some cost reduction thing. There are several places on the battery that are missing fasteners, I'm assuming all of which are on purpose. There's also a significant air gap under the battery modules. There wasn't one on the top, so I'm guessing this is there to protect the battery in the case of the car driving over road debris, which, I mean, what are the chances of that happening? 
These two bars here are stuck to the bottom case with adhesive and also maybe some spot welds. It looks like the only way to get the middle modules out is to lift them up with giant suction cups or perhaps cosmic radiation. In any case, I need to trim up the penthouse, I mean uh, the outhouse. I started to trim off the sheet metal with some old shears. These are the kind that can cut left or right, which means they don't do either very well. So I bought some new ones. That was a much better idea. So this is about where I'm at now. The battery needs a whole new case designed for it. The outhouse needs a broken part replaced and the holes to all be plugged and it needs to be reassembled into a functional part. I also have a million other things to do on the car like remove the frame and full weld it, build the suspension, wire up the motor controller. Next time we'll do, I don't know, one or two of those things. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Car projects are fun, but challenging. You need somebody who's been there, who has all the answers. Hit that subscribe button and I'll let you know when I find that person. Thanks for watching.